Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike. And before you get too sucked into this awesome interview, do us both a favor. Like, subscribe, and share this amazing piece of entertainment. Because I am here with the one, the only, Michael Godoy! What an intro. Hello. How are things? Good. Good. It's a normal day. (laughs) Off today, so that's that's always a a plus. (laughs) It's a better than normal day, then. Yeah. All right. All right. Do you have a favorite dad joke for us on this better than normal day? Oh, man. Uh, uh, Yeah, well, my favorite dad joke is the uh, when does a a, uh, dad joke become a dad joke? Or when does a joke become a dad joke? That's what it is. And when it becomes uh, a parent, right? No. Oh, I see. I, I see it there. I see what you did. Very sneaky. I don't know. That's always been my favorite one because it's just, I, I think <laughs> that's the epitome of all dad jokes right there. <laughs> it's definitely the etymology of all dad jokes. Yeah, but, for sure. Wordplay. Well, get into it. Do you have a favorite underutilized word, my friend? Uh, Fortnite, I think, is my favorite one. Um, I don't even use it myself as often as I'd like, but it's just, it's kind of a dumb word for something that's already, you know, there. Dimitri Martin has a fun little joke about it where he's like, uh, I'd like to wait two weeks till after anything, or two weeks after something has happened to me before I even tell anybody about it, just so I could use the word Fortnite. <laughs> oh, and here I thought you were talking about the video game. Silly no, no. Me. No, I'm a so gamer. So Fortnite means is. two two weeks. Yeah. Fourteen days past. Nice. Yeah. Nobody ever uses it, and it's no. It's always really funny. When, <laughs> well, and that's the thing now. Now that Fortnite, the video game, is named Fortnite, like people assume that's what you mean. Yeah. There they go. Fortnite ruining something else for people. Yep. <laughs> Gosh damn kids. What would you say your biggest everyday temptation is? Caffeine. No, that that's a that's an addiction, my friend. Yeah, oh, yeah. Talking about a temptation. Temptation. Uh, give me an example. Like for me, it's chocolate. Sure. If I if I am like checking out at like oh. a supermarket okay. or like a gas station, I just look and see while I'm waiting there in line, and there's this bevy of chocolate bars being like, "Hey, Isaac, how you doing?" Hey. I'm like, "I'm doing okay." Like. Really? <laughs> she wanted to be doing better. I'm like, oh, blah, blah. and then I run screaming and forget to pay for everything. And the cops chase me. It's a whole debacle. Sitting there looking at you. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, no. Um, no, you're doing. When you put it that way, I'm thinking ice cream, specifically soft serve ice cream. I don't know why, but like McDonald's is an example. Their soft serve seems better than a lot of people. Frost or freeze is really good, but soft serve ice cream is like, if I'm ordering from anywhere that has those things, I'm like, so so how's their ice cream? Like, I just have to know. Like, ice cream's my thing. What's your what's your go-to flav? Uh, honestly, vanilla is usually my go-to on a lot of things. But if I'm going to go, like, for example, Cold Stone, they've got cake batter. They're one of the few places that have it regularly. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you can't go wrong with Reese's. You can't go wrong with Kit Kat. Um, my least favorite, probably Rocky Road. Yeah, uh, I feel like Rocky no, Road's a bit well, overrated. It's well, got too much going on. Well, it, it does have way too much going on. But I think my thing with Rocky Road is funny because, like, I like all the individual ingredients. But put them together and it just makes me sick. Like, literally, the last time I had Rocky Road, I threw up. And I was like, I don't know if it's the Rocky Road or something else I ate, but Rocky Road's out for the rest of my life. That's that's me with olives on pizza. Only had olives on pizza once. Didn't particularly like it. It was just super hungry and that was the only one available. And I had like food poisoning the next day bad. So me and olives never again. Not that I particularly liked it ever. So that's fair. Uh, also <laughs> is, is cold stone technically soft serve? Cold stone is not soft it... serve, but like yeah. ice cream, it, it, the, 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 uh, the obsession is definitely, um, ice cream in general, but like soft mm-hmm. serve is where my go-to is just cause it's the easiest yeah. thing to get. Like drive through at McDonald's the... on the way home from work and it's open late. It's very easy to get. Also, I don't know about you, but I have very sensitive teeth. So soft serve is great because I can just ingest it without having to like fight it at all. Not that eating ice cream is a battle, but for me, it's a, a bit of um, it's kind of like making a seating chart at a wedding of like the uh, oh man, I was going to sound cool. 
who's the families in Romeo and Juliet? The uh, whatever those peeps. I wouldn't. Uh, have but the I mean, it's like setting, setting those down where it's like nobody's sitting next to each other. It's like getting them past my incisors and all that, so I don't have that. <laughs> like yeah. just eating hot soup kind of face. <laughs> Uh, have yeah, you... But with soft serve, it's very uh, – it's all you can almost do it with a straw. It's great. This is going to sound like it has no, like, comparison to the conversation, but I'll, 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 I will promise I'll get back to it. But have you ever seen Hit a movie me. called uh, Unleashed with Jet Li and Morgan Freeman? Unleashed? Yeah, it's also called Danny the Dog, depending on, like, what – Oh, oh yeah, where it is. It I've seen bits of it. I didn't know Morgan Freeman was in that. Morgan, I know it was that, that is by far my favorite movie, but there's a funny thing in there because it follows a kid who or a guy who grew up basically as a uh, as a weapon, yeah, and doesn't understand basic like human shit. And he gets put in a situation where he has ice cream for the first time with like his like new adopted family, yeah. and like they're explaining to him how to eat it. Like, no, you got to move it around your mouth. You got to move it around your mouth. Yeah. Like, and like he gets caught later having ice cream when he wasn't supposed to, and they're like. Did you get ice cream? He's like, ice cream. He's like, first it's cold, but then it's sweet. And he's like, it's a, <laughs> it's a funny little, like, I don't know. It, it's a good movie. Yeah. Jet Li and Morgan Freeman are in the scene, so it's, also, you can't go uh, wrong. Morgan Freeman plays a blind guy, right? Yes, he does play a blind yeah, guy. Yeah, okay, yeah. No wonder I couldn't remember who he was. It's just like he's wearing shades. Yeah. He got me. But, I remember I, Bob Hoskins, <laughs> the late Art yeah. Bob Hoskins is in it, too. Like I, He is. Like, playing he the is. only villainous role I think I've ever seen him play. And he plays it and, so well. He is so oh, unlikable yeah. in that movie. He's an, ass hat yeah that that that, is by far my favorite movie though so would you say that is your movie that you'll never skip when channel surfing oh yeah but generally i mean i don't channel (laughs) surf that often but like i will go out of my way occasionally to just (laughs) like you know what let's go watch that movie it's one of those things i'll watch because i'm also the type of person who will rewatch a lot of stuff i've already watched and that that is a movie that gets rewatched by me at least once twice a year yeah that that movie's a banger anything with like where the not that Jet Li can't say words, but the movies where he says the less words are the better because that means he's punching more, and that's why I came to see Jet Li. <laughs> that's fair, but like even then, but, the, the talking scenes in that are filled in with Morgan Freeman, oh, who is just yeah, phenomenal. Exactly. Like you're like ah, oh, you get the best of everything here, and then yeah. like the storyline, I just I just I found interesting there. It's Rocky Road done right. <laughs> It's got a lot of things, but it's it's good. It's got a lot of things, but it actually uses them correctly. Yeah. Growing up, did you have a favorite book? Um, I actually didn't read a whole lot growing up, but when I did read, the only things I was like read were things I was made to read, like through school. And the mm-hmm. ones I was made to read that I liked were uh, I liked Holes and I liked the first two Harry Potters. Um, and then I, st- I didn't re- but I didn't read any ones after that. And then as an adult, the only other thing I went back and re- was reading because I did audiobooks rather than actually reading was um, Ender's Game. And I, if you haven't seen Ender's Game or read that book, it, it hits a pretty interesting twist that you don't really see mm-hmm. coming. At least I didn't when I read it the first time. Um, but I, that again, I mean that that wasn't really growing up. I was already uh, graduated high school by the time I read Ender's Game. Still very much in good company. I think it's like the fourth time somebody said this on this podcast. So maybe uh, I got to read Ender's Game. Yeah, it's good. It's it's got a it's got a, an interesting like uh, climax to that film. We were like, oh, well then. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. Like you just without yeah. spoiling something. Just it's worth yeah. the read. It's worth the watch. Uh, I do definitely think the the book did it better, and that's that's things that people say. Oh, all the time about anything they've read that's just the case um and sometimes it's for different reasons i think specifically the reason is here is there's a lot of dialogue in the book that is taking place from the perspective of the main character so you're reading his thoughts you're reading exactly how he feels in that moment and that's something that's very hard to convey in media that is you know video that's one of the things i've been talking about with my brother on my other podcast super pros bros sick plug uh is that you can't like when you're translating text to film whether it's like manga or a movie or a like a comic or a book is that doing anything that has a lot of character thought which is good in its own way if done correctly is so hard to do on screen because either it's lost and then you're missing that big relevant element and you have to make up for it somehow which is usually impossible or well, you have to try to include it and most people hate it well what's interesting is ender's game actually had a um 
like the movie itself the book's old the book's very old i don't remember what year it came out but it's very old and not long after the book like hit its stride in the market it actually had uh opportunity to be made into a movie and because the studio executives like there's a girl in the movie and they wanted to make her like the love interest but the kid's like 12 or something nine in the books or something he's young and the the studio wanted to make that like a love interest and the writer just kept going no fuck you that's not what the book's about and wouldn't let them have the rights to the movie for the longest time that being said he also didn't want to make it into a movie because he didn't really know how it would translate knowing how much of the book is done from the perspective of the main character having his like thoughts in there uh and then if you look into that book which is something i did after i'd read it was there's uh, a a couple there's a version of the book that got written after where it's basically the exact same story but it takes place from the perspective of the best friend and when that Mm -hmm. book came out the writer has like an interview he did where he talks about how when that book came out it made it the the movie appeared for me immediately because i could see how i can make that movie work from the perspective of someone else so even when you watch the movie it's from obviously from the perspective of the main character but a lot of the inspiration for how they made those scenes work came from the second book that came out which is the same story for the perspective of the best friend oh um, that's so smart that's yeah that's really cool yeah because that's the how way, they uh, figured it out book came out in 1985 uh written by orson scott card and yeah also that is a thing if you look back in like the 80s the 90s and even the 70s every single movie there's always a love interest it doesn't yeah. matter if it they, is. like yeah. if you look at the bridge over the river kwai the movie is about a prison escape and then uh, like a uh, prison freedom. And it's all about POWs. The amount of women that are in the movie is like, I don't know, collectively five minutes tops. And yet they still make a love scene and a quasi love interest appear. That is just so forced. And so like, who gives a shit? This is irrelevant, but that's something they always did in every single movie back then. Yeah. And from what I understand through the interview with the uh, writer of that book is he refused to give any studio the rights to make it a movie. If they changed that detail, he was adamant that like, no, that's that's very smart considering his character's like 11. (laughs) Yeah, like, it's not what the story's about. They were like, yeah, let's, like, I think, uh, if I recall the, inter- it's been a while since I've heard the interview. It's been, like, eight years or something, but uh, mm-hmm. listen to the interview, because I listened to it at the end of the audiobook, and he talked, if I recall, he said something like, yeah, the studio wanted to make the character, like, four years older and give him a love interest, and he's like, no! <laughs> like, <laughs> and, yeah, it, it respect just... It, respect for him sticking to his guns. That, that was very smart. Oh, yeah, it's good, and, like, this is this is one of those things with media that happens nowadays. Like, there's uh, there's sometimes it's like an executive or someone who has the position being like yeah this will sell books and i'm like no fuck you the other one is <laughs> um like a good example of this happening nowadays is like avatar like the live action avatar that netflix is working on like there was a lot of hype for that at first at first everyone is excited for that but then the original writers left the project and only labeled it as creative differences which means netflix is doing something they're not they're not happy with which mm. means it's probably gonna suck unfortunately well, fingers are crossed, but yeah, most likely you're right. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath. As soon as I saw that the writers left, I'm like, all right, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, get fucked. <laughs> so if you had to evacuate your house, God forbid, let's say there's a fire or a tsunami is coming, what's the first non-living thing you'd grab and make sure it got rescued to safety? That's the basic answer. I don't have, like, how much time I have or anything else. Nope. You You, you know you get one shot out the door. You might not be able to go back in. So, like, whatever you can take out in one trip. Shut out the door. Don't know what I can take back. Um, this is assuming I already have clothes on, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> not that I sit around naked. I don't, but I'll probably be in pajamas. Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I have a lot of cool shit. Um, uh, it, I, it's... I feel... The, see, my first thought is to grab my entire set of cards. Like, that's the first thing I grab. The problem is, is uh, you ever ha- tried to lift a few reams of paper? It turns out it's not that light. You no, know, it's very heavy. The, the, the box that – or the place where I keep all my cards is incredibly heavy. Um, that would be the first thing I'd want to grab, but I don't know if I could. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I'd do it, but I don't know if I'm, like, getting down the stairs safely. I have stairs at my place, so – um, the next thing I'd grab besides like the basic shit I'd probably already have in my pockets, like my phone or whatever, would probably be my uh, my tower, which is on my computer. Um, PC for life, baby. 
Yeah, I mean, PC Master Race. Um, I think in that quick of a scenario, like if I had time to sit there and think about it at the moment, like, oh, there's a fire coming. I've got three minutes. I might come up with a better solution of like, let me grab my like yearbook or something from a specific year or something like that or an art book that I have because I have a couple art books that I've done myself or I've worked on them. Um, th- those would probably be better answers. But my initial thought, like in that moment, would probably be grab my cards or my PC and PC is a lot lighter <laughs> grab your pc and peace out yeah all right do me a favor clear your mind mm-hmm. now what's the first thing that comes to mind when i say underrated um god i'm supposed to have an answer quicker than that <laughs> um I'm going back to Unleashed again. There are so many people who have not seen that fucking movie. Go watch that (laughs) fucking movie. It's so good. Like, not everyone's going to watch it and be like, that movie was great. But no, that movie is fucking amazing. It's still my favorite movie. And so many people I've talked to are just like, what's that? I've never heard of it. It's like, oh, Morgan. I don't know this thing. And and it's funny because it's so easy to sell someone on it. Like, it's a martial arts movie with Morgan fucking Freeman. (laughs) Bob Hopkins in a villain role, and he's and he's so yeah. unlikable. It's so good. Yeah, I'm still gonna go. You got, mind, you got mind control, Jet Li at his prime. It's all there, baby. Yeah, it's it's really good film. It's so good. What would you say your favorite industry secret or term that's only used in your line of work is? Um, well, like the, uh, in poker specifically, I like the, uh, the drawing dead is a term because it's used specific or not, not drawing dead. Sorry. Drawing dead is one of them, but I think, uh, the term, the nuts, because even with non poker people, if you use it as slang to describe something else, they kind of know what you mean. (laughs) And even the opposite of that is very fun when something shitty happens, or if you're out with friends and something kind of lame has happened, you're like, refer to something as the nut low. (laughs) <laughs> and and that always think... gets a laugh out of people. Oh yeah, especially the poker think... people. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's because that's such like a human physicality, like obvious thing that's like easy for people to kind of understand? You know, like from a male perspective, nuts being like the best thing. It's kind of just like automatically intrinsic. Or do you think that poker is just so proliferated our society that like everybody just kind of gets it? Even if they don't realize why. I think it's um it has more to do with like anyone with any kind of common sense hears it used the way it's used and just from context can be like, Oh, that means something really good or ah, that yeah. means something really bad. Um and reasons that, that, why robots will never replace us. Yeah, they just they just like, ah, oh, that's what it means. Okay. That is the nuts. It's like, I don't know what it means. Help. Some <laughs> human come along and inflect so I can understand. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's still one of my favorite things to use. That and, like I said, Drawing Dead was another one. <laughs> yeah. Just like, uh, I'll never forget. So, back to story time. Um, I remember we were sitting at an 80 No Limit table at the bike one time. And I was sitting there with my friend. She was playing and I was just sitting behind her watching her play and we were eating. And one of the guys at the table kept flirting with her. Like, heavy flirting with her. It was like, oh, blah, 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 blah. He's like, hey, when are we going to go out? Stuff like that. Eventually, I leaned up and I was like, "You're drawing dead, amigo." <laughs> and he, uh, the table got a good laugh. She was cracking up, and he just kind of like, he thought it was funny, but he also was like, "Oh, emotional damage." Like... Crap. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where you didn't realize that you weren't being obvious as hell, and you thought you were like kind of being subtle, and nobody like saw it that way. You're like, "I've been outed." Oh no. Yeah, no, he he he's a, he was a good dude. Like he had a pretty good sense of humor about it. He thought it was funny, but took like, it well. Nice. He took it pretty well. Yeah, he's he's a good dude. He still plays there now, actually. Is there a piece of advice you've been told over the years that has made the biggest impact on you, or that you find yourself pondering even to this day? Oh, um, I can think of one specific thing. One of my friends told me. I remember I was interested in this girl, and then I was like interested in trying to date her, and one of my I remember uh, overthinking it because that's a common thing of guys in general, but specifically me overthinking something with a girl. And I remember uh, talking to my friend about it and being like, yeah, I don't really know what to say, blah, blah. And he he hit me with two things. And the first one was if you have to think about it too much, then it's probably not a good conversation anyway. Mm -hmm. Second one was it almost doesn't matter. (laughs) 
It almost doesn't matter. Now, I say <laughs> almost because, like, obviously don't say some weird shit. But a lot of things that even at, at first thought might you might suspect to be like, oh, that's kind of weird or strange. Like, mm -hmm. if she wants to talk to you, she's going to talk to you. And that's, that's the bit yeah. of advice. It almost doesn't matter. If she wants to talk to you, she's going to talk to you. And, like, I, the example I'm using is with girls. But that is in general with most people. If you're like, ah, oh, I'm not sure about these group of friends. Like, if they want to hang out with you, they're going to hang out with you. Yeah. Uh, one thing that that is, like, people don't also necessarily go out of their way to, like, hit, hit their friends up. Because I have tons of friends I've been friends with for years who I don't hang out with all that often. I have a couple mm -hmm. friends who live out of state. But then the moment they're in state, we go and hang out somewhere. And it's like we've been hanging out this whole time. It's it's yeah. We pick up right where we left off. Um, yeah. And um, not concerning yourself not, – not to say who gives a shit what anybody thinks, but not concerning yourself too much with what other people think is is, is a big thing that will get you a long way. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in, in a way, this goes to dealing with me, it, it, being a poker dealer, because you know for sure because you've been dealing even longer than I have. But um, if you've ever played at a casino, especially for people who haven't been in a casino very often, if you've ever go to a casino and you watch people play uh, poker and just mm -hmm. listen to some of the shit that people say to dealers <laughs> – I've had people say some despicable shit to me, and like some people can't handle it. I know people who have gone through dealer training and spent months going through it or weeks going through it or however long, and they finally get to this dealer to the point where they're a dealer. They sit down and they go and deal, and like someone says some offhanded shit to them, and like a week later they're going up to the supervisor like, yeah, I quit. <laughs> and that has happened. That's true. I know at least three people that have done that because they can't handle people talking shit to them. And I, I, I have a little bit of a different mentality on it. It's like, well, I really don't give a shit what you think. I know that I'm good at my job, so I do a good job. And beyond that, I don't give a shit what you think. You know what I mean? Um, totally. And... I, remember the f I remember when I first started early on, I don't remember if it was a floor or a friend or somebody in training was like, dealing's more about dealing with the players than it is dealing with the cards. Uh, to an extent, I... that's true. I, I have found over my lifetime that if you can deal with the players, you can deal with the cards. It's what it, you might not be as good, but it, it's kind of like one is pass or fail. And the other is a matter of degrees. Right. Cause like, if you, obviously it's better to be able to deal with cards. Like, I mean, you're saying in your story, like you have people that pass the Academy, which from what you've told me passing the Academy to get into the bike back when they had that open and like people were, they were accepting like new trainees that was very difficult yeah. and getting through that was super hard, but then they're not, you know, like two, three weeks in, they're like, I can't deal with the people. It's like, if you got an A in the Academy or got a C, you know, let's pretend that they had grades. Oh. And if you got, you know, if, if C was somehow passing, if you have somebody who gets an A and somebody who gets a C, but the per but then they make it through and they can't handle the players. It doesn't matter if they got an A. Yeah, it really doesn't. Um, I remember the first week I was dealing at my first dealer job. I was obviously very green. I was very young. I was 19. And I was dealing <laughs> in this little tiny mountain town in Northern California. And I'm dealing. And I know the guy knows a lot of the uh, management staff. Like he knows the floor. Like he's like talking with him very friendly. And so I'm like, oh, this guy like knows people. He's probably pretty chill. You know, we can kind of hang out and like talk. Like I'm not like really worried about anything. I'm dealing and he's losing and he's kind of getting frustrated and I get it. I'm like trying to sympathize. I'm like, yeah, man, it sucks. And he loses and he goes, you deal yourself a blackjack one more time. I'm going to fucking kill you. Like 19 been in town a week. And I don't know if he's joking. Yeah. And I was just like, all right, this is my new reality. <laughs> this is my life now. Chuckles. Yeah, I'm in danger. This is life now. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> It very much felt like I I had the the facial expression and the thought of Millhouse. It was just I'm in danger. That's Ralph. Like looking at yeah. it's completely straight. What? It's Ralph, but yeah, I'm in oh, danger. Ralph. It's Ralph Wiggum, not oh, Millhouse. It's Ralph Wiggum's, yeah. Duh. But yeah, it, right. I'm in danger. Simpson it's faux pas aside, yeah. <laughs> I'm in danger. Yeah, yeah it it's exactly like, what oh. you think. This is my life now. Okay. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, no, I I get that. I've had people say some pretty despicable shit to me, and like sometimes you can tell when someone's kind of kidding or just frustrated, and yeah. then like sometimes it's like, 
who hurt you? <laughs> like, what is yeah. wrong with you? Like, it, it, the, the, the thing that gets me about it is there's people who come in and play for hours and hours and hours and hours. And, like, even when they're taking really bad beats, they're still just the happiest people. Mm -hmm. um, they can be like, oh, oh, that sucks. Next hand. Like, uh, yeah. but you'll have someone who comes in, plays, like, four hands, and the entire time, the rest of the night, they're, they're shitty because they got a couple bad beats early on. And it's like, if you're that unhappy while you play, why are you still playing? Like, uh, the, the, the best ones are the ones who win a pot and they're still mad with you or they chop a big pot and they're mad yeah. at you. Like, look, you weren't, you weren't, uh, what is it? Uh, free, free running? Uh, what's, um, it's, free rolling. yeah, you weren't free rolling. Thank you. I couldn't remember the fucking phrase. Yeah. You weren't free rolling. You could, I could have put a card out there where you lost. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, <laughs> and there's a little shitty like is... oh, i could have won more like you could have won nothing get the fuck out of here like <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm the my dickhead. favorite is when you sit down deal one hand they lose and they're just like next dealer i always lose with this guy he's the worst it looks like i've been here for seconds not even minutes <laughs> i have been here for seconds maybe i'm not saying give me a long chance like you don't have to wait until i'm gone to like write the answer to your survey but maybe give me actual minutes like <laughs> yeah um i was talking to a dealer the Get other a day sample size, please. <clears throat> yeah exactly I was, I was talking to a dealer the other day who was telling me like yeah i was gone for a couple weeks because this and that and she gave me reasons but does, doesn't matter here and she gets to the table and she was she was venting to me about it in the break room she's like yeah i sit down at table whatever whatever and the asshole in seat three is like ah. Oh, See, this dealer again, she killed me a bunch yesterday. I lost like 600 with her. It's like, <laughs> I, I didn't even work the last two weeks. You did not. You liar. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if that's like, and that, that's to me, that's a funny one. Because the dealer I was like, do all dealers look the same to you? Like, <laughs> I, and it's funny. Yeah, cause we're, we're, like, we're just the, the parents and Charlie Brown. All they see is like the waist down. They're just like black pants dealer okay <laughs> yeah like, like, occasionally they see the haircut know if it's a, a boy or a girl that's it <laughs> there's it's yeah. just like complete monotone from us for sure and I, I've, I've been dealing long enough especially in the same place and i'm good with names and faces and stuff and kind of learning who you can joke with and who you can't joke with and i've sat down at a table two hands and the guy's like oh why are you killing me and blah 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 and you learn who you can joke with some people you just say nothing you don't even make yeah. eye contact. You just keep going because, like, it doesn't matter. But then you have some people you can joke with and be like, hey, man, it's it's two hands. Come on. I had a guy yeah. uh, who was on 4-8 the other day who was giving me shit about killing him. And I'm like – I turned it on its head when I was getting up from the table. I was like, I hope you lose so bad it's a jackpot. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, like, at first it's like this dealer's an ass. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's – it's kind of a funny thing for those of you out in pseudo radio land. Uh, there is such a thing at most casinos and this casino in specific called a bad beat jackpot, wherein if you lose a horrendously unlikely scenario, you get paid lots of money. It is cool. It also almost never happens. It's low chance for sure. Uh, I know dealers who've been dealing in the casino business for 20 years, never dealt one. I know people who have been there weeks and have dealt you like can't four. See it. You can't see it right now, but I'm raising my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, I remember uh, there was a dealer who made it through school. It was, it was I, I heard this story. This is not my own story, but it was like a week before, a couple weeks before I started, a couple months maybe, where she mm. had finished her dealer training. She got out there for her first day, and I'm fairly certain it was her first table and like third hand ever. <laughs> she dealt a jackpot and the entire table freaked and she didn't know what she had done she was like <laughs> she thought she she's just the sitting there like what's going on because everyone starts yelling and screaming and cheering and she's like confused and the floor comes up and they're like what's going on and she's like i don't know i don't know <laughs> i need an Help adult me. like and, <laughs> and uh apparently it was a really good table they calmed her down and they're like yeah it's good you win blah blah, blah. it's a good thing it. And because she's so green, she actually ended up doing, from what I understand, really well tip-wise on that table. And apparently the guy who won the pot literally mm. pushed it into her tray. Like, it wasn't that big of a that's pot, but still, awesome. he literally shoved it into her yeah. tray and then tipped her on top later. It was really, I mean, that's really funny story. Just as visual aesthetically, let's go. <laughs> just be like, yeah, whoosh. Especially as a brand new dealer who's never yeah. dealt the game to just be like, oh, this is what's going on? What did I do? I, I um, love that story within a minute of me telling my first week story of just being threatened to death. Like, the opposite, right? The exact opposite. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, It's funny, too. Too, because I remember 
um, the bike doesn't have it now, but they used to have a high hand. It, it, I'm sure it'll eventually mm. come back when COVID kindly fucks off and things get some semblance of normal. They start bringing back all these promotions like raffles and high hand and stuff. Anyway, the bike used to have a high hand. And my second hand at a table ever on the live mm. poker floor, now, mind you, I had dealt other games, but the first time I'd ever dealt cash game live um yep. my second hand ever was a was a high hand and that shit was not explained to me like the guy like my <laughs> second hand ever was like a, like i don't even think it was quads i think it was like aces full of queens or something it was like on the lower end for a high hand and the guy was like high hand high hand and i'm like whoa what did i do <laughs> what's going on <laughs> and like i look over at uh the the, the, <laughs> the person who trained me and like because he happened to be kind of shadowing sitting around waiting to see if some shit would go down and he's yeah. like what's going on he goes over and he's like yeah yeah just keep going and he like lets the floor know, and they put the high hand up. Whatever, it gets replaced. Somebody else gets a higher high hand because it's only a full house. But it was still really funny not knowing what was going on. Because one thing I learned going through dealer training is there is so much they can pre- they can prepare you for, but there is a fuck lot they can't. Yeah, like a lot of the stuff that happened because it's not like. Um... A good example is I used to work in a print shop, and teaching people things in the print shop was difficult because there was a lot you could teach, but there was a ton you couldn't, right? Mm -hmm. You couldn't just like, hey, uh, I need to teach someone how to do binding, for example, right? Which is like getting a – making a book basically and putting a spiral through it is an example, right? You couldn't – you could, but you shouldn't waste materials on teaching someone that. Um, okay. so it was really hard if you had a new person come in, like, Hey, I need binding. Well, we kind of need a job for binding to appear. So I could teach you without wasting yeah. materials. And that was like a weird issue with that. And in poker training, it's very different. Like, Oh, well, what happens if this happens? Well, I need to know the scenario. Well, that's why dealer training takes so long. At least if you want it done right is you need all these scenarios to appear and be a thing so that people can go, Oh, that's how you handle it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't it doesn't work if you're just like, oh, here's all the rules, go go run the game. Well what if this happens? Well, that won't happen that often. But if it does, here's what you do. And like there's a lot of scenarios. And I get I get asked by dealers all the time, hey, this and this happened, what should I have done? And it's like, well, this. But yeah. but like a lot of those scenarios that didn't come up in dealer training because they're just like one of those niche moments that doesn't happen that often, or if it does happen, you didn't notice because somebody else corrected it for you or whatever. I mean, the, the, the simple fix is like most things in retail, it's the same thing for dealing is if you don't know, you call the manager or in our case, what is called the floor is basically a a sort of manager for poker dealers and just dealers in general. We just call the floor, they come over and deal with it, which is like the perfect fix. Obviously you want the dealer to be as trained as much as they can to deal with most and all problems, but it's one of the nice blanket fixes. Yeah. about like something like that it's like there's so many array things it's like and if you don't know you just always raise your hand and call floor yeah that that is <laughs> that is actually the, the correct answer if you don't know the answer you call the floor um yeah. i've always been the type of person i remember getting uh not not my job before not my job now but the job before this i had i got that job because during the interview my question to the uh like what makes you more unique is like of someone to hire and my answer was i'm the type of person who likes to know the answer to the question before the question even gets asked and it's a very good answer <laughs> well and that goes down to like he would go they would ask me how to do something and i'd be like well i already know the answer and that that mm-hmm. goes down to dealer training with knowing how to handle a scenario before the scenario even presents itself right and that 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 is yeah that's that's a big part of just bettering yourself uh the bike academy the bike doesn't have an academy for training dealers anymore but for a long time it did and even long after i'd finished my dealer training and passed my top section training and done all that i often went back there not necessarily to practice dealing but to watch others deal because you learn a lot watching other players or people learn to deal and watching them make certain mistakes and then watching how they correct and fix mistakes you learn a lot doing that than you do actually even dealing you learn a lot dealing obviously i'm not trying to say you don't but you learn a lot by doing that which is why i went back so often i also helped train a bunch of other people in dealing just cuz it that was what's that thing like the the best way to learn something is to teach someone else how to do it it's the other reason i went back so often that is yes very much good so before we move on to the next question kind of serendipitous funny anecdote i have been dealing since i was 19 i'm now 34 never dealt a jackpot <laughs> i 
up until two years ago had never dealt nor personally received uh, a Royal flush. And one night I'm calling my friend who I went to college with and we were just talking about it. I was like, yeah, I've never dealt. It's like coming up. I was like, yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, I either just dealt or I think later that day dealt a Royal flush. I was like, is the first time he goes, really? I was like, yeah. And I've never dealt, uh, you know, bad. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. I've done anything. He was the first time I played poker and he is not one to lie. He was the first time I played poker. My third hand was a Royal flush. And before I left, we hit the bad beat jackpot. <laughs> wow. Talk about like, boost. Cool. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. JPEG. I'm <laughs> like, and then like within that week, I dealt a Royal and then each month for six consecutive months until we closed down because of COVID, I dealt a Royal flush every month. So wow. I was just like, I was like backed up with Royal flushes. And I just had to I just like get them out of my system. That's just how <laughs> the, the cards fall. I've been dealing for, yeah. uh, I want to say, let's see about four years now going on. And mm-hmm. in that time, I think I've I've turned it I've turned it for another player I think twice, and I've flopped it once. Straight flushes I've done a lot of those I've done a fair amount of yeah. everything else, but I've royal, done a dozen. royal yeah. I've I flopped it for a player once I believe and turned it twice, and it was funny because uh, the high hand thing I was talking about my very first I uh, I'd been dealing for a bit in tournament first, and I moved to cash game, and I had been doing cash game. It was my third day I believe in cash game, and. The my first hand of the day was a um, was a royal flush for a guy who had never hit a royal flush. He was excited, and That's awesome. then he hit his high hand, and the high hand at the time paid five fifty, and he gave me a hundred bucks. And like at the time, that was the biggest tip I had received ever, and I was just like, <gasps> like that, <laughs> like like when you first start dealing in the bottom section, like you're making a hundred dollars a day, like ninety, like if you're good, you're making like ninety to like one twenty a day. So getting a hundred dollars outright, my third day working was like the biggest hype. I was so excited. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So, given the opportunity, what is your favorite personal anecdote to tell? Mm. Oh, I can go on for days, is clearly. But um, uh, my favorite, my favorite one that comes to mind whenever people are like, "Oh, do you got any stories about dealing?" Because that that's the question I get a lot. Um, one of my favorites was uh, it was is is uh, maybe a couple years into dealing at the time, and I come to sit down at a five five table, and there's three players, and two of them still play there, so I'm not going to use anybody's names. They will know who they are later if they hear it. But um, anyway, we're going to go. We're just going to call them by their seat number. We have seat one, three and seven who are sitting at the table and I sit down at the table and I've been there for a few minutes and I can tell at least 10 minutes before I sat down. There's this argument going on. They've been arguing about some shit for a while. The hand plays out in between hands. They start arguing again, and it just keeps going. They're respectful because it's a 5-5. Five five. When there's action going, they're not really saying much. They're, like, barely talking. They're talking lower. But when the when there's a big hand brewing, they, they stay quiet. They're, they're respectful about it. But any time between action, they're arguing again, and it's hilarious. But they're arguing specifically about autotune in music. And it's funny because Seat One is just, like, this 21-year-old kid who really doesn't have a stake in music, to my knowledge. He doesn't do music. Um, seat three is uh, someone who's been doing music for many, many years, and he uses autotune in his music. He's a rapper. Seat seven is a uh, rock musician. I'm not sure exactly the genre or the name of his band, but from what I understand, relatively um, well known locally. Anyway, they're arguing about autotune. Uh, the rock musician, of course, arguing how autotune is awful and the worst thing ever, and the music sucks with it, and this and that. And of course, the guy who uses autotune in his music is like, no, autotune's great. This is why. And he starts explaining why it's good because this and certain singers. I, they bring up another singer and they're talking about how good she is specifically with autotune. I don't remember the name of the singer now. And they're talking to seat one and seat one's like, yeah, no, I think she sounds good even without it. And then the other guy who's in seat seven is like, well, then why does she need to use it at all if she sounds good without it? And they're like making a point about but it does sound good. with." Anyway, this has been going on for a while. <laughs> this was going on before I sat down and I've been sitting at this table like 10, 15 minutes and they're still arguing about it. It is going on for a while. <laughs> Just when you think the conversation is basically done, out of nowhere, seat seven asks seat one by name. And he's like, yeah. Um, 
uh, how many girls have sucked your dick? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> uh, and it's funny. Damn, my initial boy, thought I is, feel. <laughs> yeah, just start. I start laughing, but my initial thought is, all right, I guess this is what we're talking about now. <laughs> like, and I'm expecting it to change the topic. I'm expecting a new topic of conversation, a weird one at that. But that yeah. that's inherently weird, but it's just out of left field, right? It sounded so weird. And then he, the guy, the guy doesn't have an answer for him. He's like, what? Because he has the same reaction I do. <laughs> what <laughs> and um eventually he goes all right all right all right and then he brings it back to the singer that they had brought up who's good with with autotune and without and he goes all right well you know eventually you're gonna find a girl who sucks your dick so good so good you're gonna sit there and think damn none of them other bitches knew what they were doing <laughs> and, and, and when you find that girl, that girl, that's the girl who sings without auto tune. And, the, and the, all the girls who, all them bitches who didn't know what they were doing, those are girls who use auto tune. What? <laughs> <laughs> but that is exactly what he said. And like, uh, maybe not the verbatim. It's been a lot of years since, a lot of times since that. It's been a couple years. But that's how I remember it. And it's still like the funniest, like, what? And I just remember see through. That doesn't even make sense. And the other guy's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> Just, he's like, yeah. He said something like her having amazing skills on the mic, and I was like, oh my god, it, <laughs> it was so funny. It is, <laughs> is one of my favorite. Like, I, like there's been tons of stories dealing, especially and even at previous jobs, but that is one of the ones that just. Yeah, that is. Uh, I guess we're talking about this effect. now. Yeah. <laughs> Man. So, Mike, what would you say is your favorite little known factoid? Uh, chronologically, we are closer to the T or the T-Rex is closer to the iPhone than the T-Rex is to the Stegosaurus. And I think that is insane. <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> Cause like a lot of people don't really think about that. The people tend to lump dinosaurs together as this one big category of, yeah, dinosaurs. They were all here and then they all weren't. They're, and it's they're, like, they were if, then and, and we and are that, now. And that is not how it works. It's more like, yeah, T-Rexes were a long time ago and Stegos were a long fucking time ago. <laughs> like, they... Turns out there's a big difference between a long fucking time ago and now. <laughs> yeah, it turns out like one of those was 60 million years ago and then the other one was like 80 million years before that. It's kind of ridiculous yeah. to think about. Uh, I think Jurassic Park and things of that nature tip that where they see those you know, species interacting with each other, you know, stegos and T-Rexes and going, oh, yep, they're part of the same group. But they're not. They're, they're, they never coexisted on Earth <laughs> at all. Like, there is a big gap between them. And it's crazy to think that, like, the iPhone is as close to the T-Rex. It's closer yeah. to the T-Rex than that dinosaur is to another dinosaur. Like, they just that many millions of years apart. And it's kind of crazy to think about. It's like, ah, there really is the, things really do go back that far. It's it's crazy. The other ones that kind of reminds me of is that Cleopatra is closer to now than she is to the pyramids of Giza being built. Again, we conflate like a long time ago and th that area or that genre of information, and like we just kind of lump everything together. So like Cleopatra, Egyptian, you know, pyramids, Egyptian, both old. Ergo you know, the same. It's like, eh, not actually so much. Yeah, that's, well, that's wild to think about. Uh, think about something even much smaller scale, like, yeah, 10 years ago was 1990. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, obviously not. But you hear something like that, and in your brain it sounds psychologically correct, because 10 years ago. Yeah. But then you think about it, and like, but now do that same thing in a much larger scale. Like, <laughs> World War One was what? Uh, fucking the 20s or something? Right, that's World War One was uh, was it twenties? Am I wrong? It's nineteen nineteen tens. Oh, it's even earlier, right? So just over like a hundred years ago, like a hundred and fifteen years ago or so, right? Mm -hmm. That is not that long ago when you consider, you know, we're in the year twenty twenty two. Yeah, not the same. I it's this is kind of the same thing and not the same thing, but the guillotine was being used up until. And I think it was a couple years after or a couple years before, but it was in the same time frame as the first release of uh, the first Star Wars film. It's still being used in the 70s. The, the last the 70s? execution, 
by guillotine in France, not in the United States, but in France was in the 1970s. Oh, uh, that reminds me. Who's the um, Who's the actor? He played Count Duco. He was in a band. He played Sormon. Um, oh, um, hold on. You know that you'll know the actor. Like, yeah, yeah, I know the I know all the stuff about this guy too. He's he's so cool. Yeah, we we talked about this before. How much just like how insane awesome he was, but. Uh, the guy who played Saruman, I can't Christopher remember. Christopher Lee. Thank you. Yeah. He actually witnessed the last execution in France or something like that. Like he was He witnessed he was there. the last execution in France. He also is the only actor in Lord of the Rings to, to actually Tolkien, meet Tolkien. Yeah, yeah. yeah I did yeah. know that. I did know that. Yeah. I remember we talked about this before, but him witnessing the execution, like makes it, like that that dude was wild. He had such the, a the wild The guy's done everything. He, he was part of a metal band. Has a good two metal band, and too. a Christmas album. They're That's, good, too. Yeah, the, it's not – and also he's a fan of metal even yeah. though he predates metal by like half his life. Like metal music <laughs> yeah. didn't exist until he was like well into his like 50s. And, he's, uh, and he heard it and was like, I can fucking do that. Like, yeah. what he's, he's, also the, he's also the inspiration for James Bond. I did and know that too. Was, That's so wild. His, his uncle is the – or his uncle or his cousin is the guy that actually wrote it and like part of the stories are based off him. He's part of the – uh, I think it was the League of, or the Office of Ungentlemanly Affairs, which is the pr- <laughs> the, the name the that predates service. the OSS, which yeah. is where uh, the idea of like the James Bond group or the Double O's came from. So yeah, it's he, his life deserves a not a movie but like a mini series at least. Yeah, it, it's a lot of wild. If you can shit fit there. all of it just in that, it's yeah, it's, it's a lot amazing. of wild shit for sure. Like, yeah. yeah, I remember reading about him years ago and just like seeing all these things and being like, "What a fucking badass!" <laughs> yeah, that man. That man has lived and done it all. He's, he's dope. Fill in the blank for me. This weekend was so great. I spent thirteen hours doing nothing. <laughs> do you mean sleeping, or do you mean like sitting around twiddling your thumbs? Like we're we talking like I, I, I mean nothing? not we... having to do anything like. Like you ever like uh who is it? You know who Dimitri Martin is? Not Dimitri yep. Martin, sorry. Um Oh god damn it, it's gonna bother me his name. Uh John John Mullaney. John Mullaney has a funny bit where he talks about he goes, You ever talk to an adult and be like, How was your weekend? Like, it was great, I did nothing and their face lights up. Right? <laughs> it, that is true when you get older. I didn't do anything at all. Yeah. Nothing at all, yeah. Like that's true when you get older. Like I'm only thirty one, but like a day, a, we, a day where I could s- spend my weekend not having to commit to doing anything but what I feel like doing in that moment. Like, I'm a gamer. I like to yeah. game, hang out with my friends. Maybe we'll go to a bar, uh, whatever we're going to do. But, like, having a, yeah, a day free from responsibility. That's what it is. Free from responsibility. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, I didn't have to do any errands or run any chores or, you know what I mean, backwards. Yeah, totally. <laughs> dot, I, I, dot I my eyes cross my T's. Yeah, that's the same kind of. In any weekend where I, I don't have any responsibilities, I can just do what I wanted that weekend, whether it is in that moment, right? Uh, go to bed when I felt like going to bed, wake up when I, without setting uh, – going to bed without setting an alarm is such a satisfying feeling. Oh, yeah. Um, it's the best. So, yeah, that's that's my thing. <laughs> All right. That's, I completely agree. <laughs> can you think of the first or most impactful memory when you realized you weren't so alone in your struggle – or when you realized that you were like more like everybody else than you previously realized? Huh. I still don't think I'm that like many people. <laughs> I don't know. Um. So for me, I guess I need to rework this question every time I have to explain it. But the what, what I mean is for me, is, I think this is the best example that kind of helps uh, illustrate this is when I was, when I went back to school, uh, when I was like 29 uh, or whatever, um, went back to college and I had to do, or I did some like presentations and get in front of the class, read something, or, you know, even times when sitting in the back of the class, reading something off my computer in class as like a response to a cue or whatever like that, my throat would tighten up and I would have trouble speaking and I would like start freaking out. And I was like, man, am I, I, everybody else would talk and like, didn't have that problem or so as far as I could tell. And I was talking to my brother about it. And I was like, man, what the hell is wrong with me? He goes, nothing. You're having anxiety, maybe a mild panic attack to public speaking. It's the number one rated thing in the world that people fear the most. 
That is like you are not <laughs> abnormal. This yeah. is completely uh, within the standard median range. You are completely fine. Don't feel like don't other yourself because you assume that nobody else is having that problem. Yeah, that's um, Seinfeld has that bit about um, uh, public speaking is the number one fear of adults, and number two is death. So, like at a funeral, you'd rather be the guy in the coffin than giving the eulogy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's I, I can kind of relate to that in in the fact that I understand it, but I I can't relate to not being able to public speak. I remember. Um, no, it's not it's not public speaking. Well, but yeah. I mean, in general, was there something though, like, that you experienced where you uh, had thought for a while or at least some amount of time that oh my god, I'm the only one that's experiencing this. What the hell is wrong with me? And then you learn that no, in fact, this is a human condition. This is something that most people are afflicted with or, you know, experience and that I am not so different, that I am not alone. I I, I, I get what you're saying. I can think of um, a feeling, but I can't think of specifically when it clicked in my head. If that hit me with the feeling, which is um, worrying about what other people think of you, Uh, which is like. That, that happens a lot commonly where you're like, oh, I wonder what this person's thinking of me. I wonder if they're thinking about mm-hmm. me. Or if someone's like – someone goes, hey, I want to talk to you about this in front of you and you, they go off and they talk and they're like, was that about me? Did they not want to speak in front of me? You mm-hmm. would – you the, the, the phrase um, – you wouldn't give a shit what anyone thought of you if you knew how seldom they do. <laughs> um, and that's true. Like I realized that – I forgot when. Like at one point it just clicked when I'm like, yeah, I really don't give a shit with you. <laughs> A lot of people think of me because they don't think about me that often. I am not on uh, anyone's mind nearly as often as I'm on my own mind about something going on in my head. So previous to that, you were constantly worried what other people thought about you? I don't know about constantly, but it it was something I would think about. I'm like, I wonder if so-and-so likes me or if I wonder if this group of people likes me or if I wonder if I'm Mm -hmm. really like – the friend of this group or if i'm just a means to an end or if i'm there or whatever Mm -hmm. but eventually it clicked like it doesn't really matter they're not thinking about you nearly as often as you think they are and anybody who is thinking about you consistently are the only people whose opinion you should really care about anyway totally like if they're not someone that you hold at some sort of like high esteem or respect then what does it matter what they think it's like um and in that regard, that's part of why I think I do so well with not caring what people think while I'm dealing. I know I'm a good dealer, right? So if I have a player who's giving me shit and like, oh, that's fucking terrible dealer, blah, 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 blah. Like, if, if this is just some guy at the poker table, like, his opinion of me doesn't matter, really. Um, but someone like a family member or someone who's being shitty with me, I may care a little more what that person thinks because – you know, their family or whatever. Their opinion holds a higher weight. Hmm. Learning not to care what the everyday person thinks is, is a big deal to, like, making yourself like, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 rarely about you when your brain can often tell you it is about you. I'm going to have to ponder on that and utilize that more in my day-to-day. In the meantime... Is there a moment that you look back on in your life that fills your chest with pride or brings a tear of joy to your eye? Um, hmm. Wonder. <laughs> I'm like, I have, I have a lot of like small accomplishments or even like somewhat big accomplishments that I'm like, yeah, but nothing that's so big that like it brings a tear to my eye, at least off the top of my head. I'm sure something will eventually come to me, but right now I don't have anything for that. I mean, it can also, it doesn't have to be a, bring a tear to your, it doesn't have to bring a tear to your eye, but it also can just like make you like, you know, proud or happy that it happened. Well, like the, the most recent example I can think of is um, when I first started dealing, I had been dealing for a few months before I got into cash game. And then I was dealing cash game for a couple weeks before I like saw the live of the bike. And it was funny because like, even now I'm not really super big on the poker scene. Like I, I know who people are. I hear names and I'm like, I recognize that name. But if I saw a lot of pros in person, I wouldn't recognize them. Right. I don't watch a lot of like poker stuff. And as far as poker streams go, I only watch live at the bike. I'll, I've watched old replays and I've watched stuff, but I don't like our competition. I just refuse to watch on principle. <laughs> right. But Tracks. Uh, in general, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I promise I'm making a point. <laughs> anyway, um, I remember when I had first started dealing uh, tournament, 
I remember this lady coming in and sitting down at the table and going, oh, so-and-so, I forgot who the pro, pro was, but she mentioned a pro. They're sitting on live at the bike right now. And they're like, really? They're over there? And like they were excited the same way you would be if you saw like, you know, a big name celebrity, right? I, I can't think of like – like I remember uh, being super excited to see Chester Bennington the first time I saw him, and I was hyped. I was so nervous I couldn't speak to him the first time I saw him, right? I, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know who that is, but – it's the lead singer at Lincoln Park. Event. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I was. Or rather so... was. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. RFP. Yeah. I was so nervous. I met him three times and the first two, I did not approach him. I didn't say a word to him that I didn't, that, you know what I mean? I was so nervous and they, they were treating that professional poker player that same way. And I just, at the time I remember not really understanding that. I was like, mm -hmm. he just plays poker. Like, well, if you're, if you really love poker, like I understand how that could be so cool for you. Um, at the time I was still pretty new, so it didn't like click the same way it does now. And, uh, I was like, what's live at the bike? Even though I'd been working at the bike for like a month at this point or less than a month, I was like, what's live at the bike? So I went out of my way to figure out what it was, talk to, uh, one of the people at work and I'm like, oh, cool. Oh, who's dealing it? Oh, okay, cool. Um, learning a little more about it and kind of being like, oh, that's very exciting. And then talking to the instructor who was helping me you know, become a dealer and about live at the bike and like, and his, 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 his TLDR of it was like, that's the position you want. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> while I was dealing, dealing tournament being like, that's the job I want. <laughs> and I got that job last year. <laughs> that's awesome. And lastly, before we throw it to a commercial break, if you could have listeners of this podcast, your one song of your choosing, which would it be? I'm going to choose one song based on my um, my like Spotify top 10 because it's the one I listen to more than any other song this year. But I do have a couple answers for this. So I'll give you my number one, or if you want, I can do it a different way, give you a couple and that, like notable mentions, then my number one. What would you prefer? Just hit us with your best shot. My favorite one, my number one most played song last year was actually Molly by Lil Dicky. Um, specifically that song is just really good. It's got Brandon Urie, the lead singer of Panic at the Disco, who does like a, uh, he does the chorus for it. It's a really good song in general. It's got some great lyrics. Um, but specifically the reason I, I, I like that song so much is because the music video hits you with kind of a gut punch. I'm not going to spoil anything for it. Cause like, I think you should watch the video and then go, ah, okay. Uh, and see if you have the <laughs> same kind of realization I did the first time I watched that video and went, ah, oh, that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just a really good song in general. And you got Brandon Yuri in it, who's just an amazing singer, who's had an interesting career. And Little Dicky's also good. He's he's actually a pretty good rapper. So That's great. I'll have to check it out. And with that, we're going to throw it to our first break. Feel free to stick around and enjoy this totally real commercial. Or take a minute to enjoy Molly by Little Dicky. Or if you wanted to hear a song from a previous episode... Check out the playlist on Spotify, Passionate People and Preposterous Peeps podcast, Song Rex. Long title, I know. Don't worry, there's a link in the description. Either way, see you in a jiffy. Have you ever wanted to kill a small woodland creature or break a window but not have the physical strength? I know I have. Now introducing Rock. Rock comes in a variation of sizes and ready to use. Simply put Rock in your hand, raise it back to ear level, and release. See? You've got it! This ad does not condone the violence against small woodland creatures or windows, nor will it be held liable for any inability of use when coming into contact with paper. And we are back. Thank you for returning, everybody. Here with Michael. Hi. Michael, what is your passion? Passion? Um, this is a tough one, but uh, sort of. Playing cards is the, the, the short answer for that question. Uh, specifically playing cards, yeah. Uh, I've been doing not playing I, cards. Well, yeah, 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 playing cards. Yeah, like hearts, <laughs> diamonds, spades, clubs. I I, I meant to no, say but it's cards not, initially, and then it's I'm like, not, yeah. You're talking about the object, not the activity. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I I don't I because I, I play poker, but I do, I play occasionally. It's like an off and on thing. I've ever, I I haven't played uh very much in the last couple years because COVID, and I just I don't like sitting there with a mask on playing. I find it distracting to myself. So I don't play in the casinos, and I, I don't want to play home games, so I just don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, ever since I was, like, in high school early on, I, at one point I was living with my uh, grandmother, who had, like, 20 channels on her fucking TV, and, like, eight of them were in Spanish. And 
uh, I didn't have a game system. The house I was living in with my grandmother was in a different school district than the school I actually went to. So, like, none of my friends lived close. So it was, like, in a, like, for all intents and purposes, all my needs were taken care of, but I was bored. <laughs> like, I was really bored because there wasn't much to do when I was home. Uh, and, uh, it kind of happened by accident, but eventually I took up like cardistry and stuff, which is d different from magic in that magic is more about illusion and tricking somebody and cardistry is just about looking very fancy and your presentation being beautiful when you're handling cards, whether it be shuffling, mixing, fanning, uh, flourishes. If you look up card flourish, you'll see kind of what I'm talking about. Very simple thing to find. Uh, and there's tons of videos on it and how to do it and just learning that kind of thing to be fancy. That's where it started. Uh, I did dabble a little bit in magic, but never too crazy. Never enough that I could have made a career out of it, but it was something that I was interested in. Um, uh, but cardistry specifically was really fun. Just uh, if, if you ever find my TikTok, that's basically the only thing on there is me fancily playing with cards or showing off my collection and that's the other thing a collection i collect playing cards and i have probably somewhere around 300 or 280 decks or something around there i'm not even sure it's been a while since i've counted i know i have at least 250 i do have a fair bit of duplicates because um there's some i like playing with and some i just don't on package and I, like, I have duplicates of that for that reason, but I just love playing cards. And I don't know exactly why my obsession is playing cards, but it's just always been what it was. Back to when I was living with my grandmother, it started because I needed something to do when I was home and bored. <laughs> like there wasn't anything else to do, so I just started playing with cards. And I was a lot self-taught, teaching myself to fan the cards, teaching myself to spring the cards from one hand to the other, teaching myself to cut the cards one-handed. All that stuff I learned on my own. Which is funny because like my technique was a little weird because of that because it was self-taught, and then I'd see another mm -hmm. magician do it or like a cardistry person like I'd see somebody else do the do something that I was already learning and they their technique would be slightly different. I'm like, oh, let me try that. So that would make it better. Um, but yeah, that's what started it. Uh, and even now, like there's some. Uh, artwork design I want done like for tattoo specifically. Like there's four different designs. I have three of them are cards, <laughs> of a sort. So I haven't gotten any of them done, but they're they're all ideas. It's a matter of finding an artist I trust enough to do it and then paying to do it. So, but yeah, cards in general. And then even now I'm 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 dealing with cards constant basis at work. I, and like I think that's another thing that helps me is I I feel very comfortable holding a deck of cards because I've spent so many hours practicing shuffling and mixing cards. Uh, building card houses and just doing interesting shit with cards so that when well, now that I'm I work with cards I'm like oh they're just they're, it's it's very comfortable for me to have a deck of cards in my hand and be doing things at the table where they'd be pulling in chips and stuff because I'm so used to just it's comfortable it's very comfortable so when was when did you first buy your own deck of cards that you still have to this day um it was ninth grade ninth grade is when that started because i was living with my grandmother around that time and then i remember going uh i used to go to the boys and girls club over in carson and i'd walk home from school to there and then i'd get picked up from there and there was a cvs on the way and i remember stopping on the way to buy a deck of cards and i remember i originally bought a deck of bridge cards which are thinner which is the ones that the casino use uh, the reason the casinos mm -hmm. use them, the, the casinos use bridge card, and a lot of people don't know that those are bridge cards, and the big, chonky ones are the poker cards. The reason casinos use bridge cards is because they're cheaper to make and cheaper to produce, and casinos go through so many of them, they use bridge. Um, I specifically used the bridge cards because I was just starting out, and I had this notion in my head that my hand was too small to do it. And that's wrong. Your hand is not too small to do it. It's just a matter of practicing. Learning the muscle memory and switching to bigger cards... Uh, like you could run into challenges if your hand is small, but you can learn to do those things with smaller cards first and move up to regular cards. And that's what I had done. But originally my first deck of cards was a bridge cards. <laughs> that's freaking rad. What is the deck that you'd say you're the most proud of uh, owning to this day? Mm, that's difficult. I have so many. Um, It's funny. I, I knew that you, there's a good chance you ask me that, and I tried narrowing down my answer in my head, but it's such a hard question to answer. Like I said, 250 decks, and at least like 180 of them are unique in some way, shape, or form. Um, mm -hmm. I have I have a couple that have been given to me made custom uh, by friends. I have one with a picture of myself and an X on it. I recently got one <laughs> from my uh, roommate, which it's uh, it's me in my Halloween costume this year. 
which looks pretty That's good, awesome. and they're actually made on pretty good quality cards. Um, That's cool. I have DBZ cards, Jurassic Park cards. I have gold cards, white gold cards. I have like every version of regular bicycle cards and bridge cards you can have. Um, I have ton from Illusionist and Theory 11, which are pretty big card manufacturers. The deck that I want the most right now that I can't get because it's not currently in print is a, is a it's called a Lovecraft deck and it's called by I, I forgot the artist's name right now. I'll see if I can find it really quick because it I, I want to give them a shout out. But it's um it's like a Cthulhu based looking uh, card deck and the design on them is so sick. <laughs> Like, I look at that, and I'm like, I want that. Like, I would get some of that shit tattooed. It's so cool looking. Um, and just finding them is very difficult, because they were doing a, um, a fundraiser for it. And, like, I was like, oh, I'll donate to that fundraiser. I'll just wait till whatever day. And then I went to go do it, the fundraiser. Like, they had sold out of all the ones I wanted, and it was just done. And they were like, yeah, hopefully we have some more soon. And it's just still been on back order. But, like, those, those, those when I get a hold of them, because they're so hard to get, will be a big one. Um... Ah, uh, yeah. But yeah, I actually have a lot of just really cool ones. I think they come in different sets that are good. I have some, it's funny because I have some that are that designed and that detail oriented. Uh, there were some that you gave me actually a while back that have just some really sick designs on them. Yeah, um, it was done by a uh, calamity wear. Yeah, those are dope too. And then I, but then I also have cards that are the minimalistic decks, where literally on the back it's just a line, and then on the front there's no like pips for each symbol it's literally just the number and a symbol and the symbol's not even the normal symbols it's like a triangle instead of a heart and <laughs> like it's super super basic so i have them in the the full spectrum and they're they're all just so good and like as far as quality goes i'm only looking for cards that you that have good quality to them uh mm -hmm. that way they can be performed for cardistry stuff because like cards that stick together very hard don't do well for that <laughs> truly i so do they all do, do none of them stay mint in box? Do you kind of just use them all? Uh, a majority of mine. Well, like you said, a majority I have duplicates of. So the ones I try not to use them if I don't have a duplicate, but I will. <laughs> I'm not opposed to using a deck of cards for something that I, I don't have a duplicate of, but I will avoid mm -hmm. it if I can. Like there's some sense. that are just so cool. Like, uh, let me see. Just look at the name of this deck really quick. Uh, the Joker and the Thief is the name of this deck I have in front of me now. And, yeah, it's got some really sick designs all the way across the board. I don't have a duplicate of this one, but it's the kind that I want it. Like, next time I'm shopping for cards, I might buy a duplicate deck just so I have a sealed one. That's cool. Yeah. Would you say – what would you say is the biggest misconception about cardistry and card collection by the wider world? Biggest misconception. Other than it's conflation with, uh, like, magic. That is the biggest misconception. People assume if you're good at one. Well, the other thing, too, is people um, – here, here's the irony of this. How I got into dealing is completely, like, by accident. I was working at this uh, – at, at a company that did – that had their own print center, and I was working in the print center. And, like, I was not in the best of moods. <laughs> I just remember, like, I got to a point where I was like, fuck it, at work. And I started playing with cards at work because it was a distraction when the work was slow. And I remember we had this customer came in and he goes, hey, can I get um, this printed, this printed, this printed? He had his own company. It was a nonprofit organization that he wanted a bunch of banners and shit printed for. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, we're sitting there going back and forth, getting all the details down for his stuff, writing down this, what he wants on it, what numbers he wants where, how much the pricing is, we're quoting. And we're doing all the work, right? Mm -hmm. While that's going on, congruent with it, is I'm playing with cards literally the whole time. Like, I, I, like I'm taking his order while I'm sitting there cutting them with one hand shuffle 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 he asks a question and i need both hands for it so i spread the cards across the table like the way a poker dealer would to spread them um mm -hmm. he says something else cool i flip the cards and fan them over pick them back up and keep going and like the entire time we're going back and forth i'm playing with and shuffling cards and he doesn't say anything at first or seem bothered by it but eventually he goes you know you'd make a really good poker dealer which is true that at the time even that was true just in like obviously the evidence speaks for itself but more um people think that someone who's good with like cardistry and being a magician would make a good poker dealer and that is not true <laughs> actually the two don't necessarily go hand in hand my example of this is uh casinos generally won't want to hire a magician because <laughs> magicians Fact. would want would, they, there's even though most even though it's not completely true there there's this notion that magician would want to cheat 
and that's just, just not the case. But like more um, – there's a procedure you're supposed to follow, the way you're supposed to handle the cards, the way you're supposed to move everything. Like when you bring the cards together at the end of a hand, shuffle, shuffle, box, shuffle, the way you cut the cards. There's a specific procedure you're supposed to follow with all of that, and all of that goes completely opposite to what you learn doing like cardistry stuff. Because cardistry is all about flair, and dealing in a casino is the opposite. Because they want everything, yeah. they want everyone doing it exactly the same way. So... Um, in a way, actually, uh, when you're training someone new to be a dealer, it's better if they have zero experience handling cards or any of that because um, there's like when when you handle your cards yourself, whether or not you're a poker player or whether or not you've tried dealing before or whether or not you've done cardistry and magic, you'll develop your own like uh, stylistic choices when doing certain things, the way you handle the cards, the way you move them around and stuff. And when you're learning to be a dealer, you have to break those habits. You have to learn not to, you know, I have a habit of when I'm holding the cards in my left hand, because I used to run my finger across them and riffle them. It was just something I did. You can hear me doing it now. Um, I had a habit of doing that. And when I first started learning to deal, they had to break that habit out of me because I had a habit of doing that. Um, I don't anymore, but like that was a thing. <laughs> and when you have someone who's brand new, who's never really handled cards, you don't have to break those habits out of them. They're just learning new good habits, you know? So there's this misconception that someone who's good at A will be good at B when A requires a lot more, or B will require a lot more than A, a of you. Because not only learning how to handle the cards properly and feel comfortable holding a deck of cards. You also need to learn to deal with people. You'll need to learn to count bets. You'll also need to learn to handle chips. And those, not all of those are necessarily like A leads to B. Yeah. Do you have a favorite non-obvious aspect to cardistry that most people might not even think about? Hmm... Uh, well, no, nothing off the top of my head. I did find it when I was first learning is just like, it was just a fun distraction. And even mm -hmm. now, like if I'm stressed out about something, playing with cards is a nice little fun distraction. <laughs> That's really sweet. So going from something that is fabulous and fantastic to frustrating, Michael, what would you say is your preposterous pre- what would you say is your preposterous peeve that you've brought with you today? Uh, the, the list can go on. Um, me and you went back and forth on this for a little bit because I was trying to find a good one. And, like, honestly, there's so many things that I'm like, that ah, bothers me more than it should. <laughs> the one I eventually landed on was uh, specifically people who ask you questions when they don't care about your answer. And I don't mean, like, a funny rhetorical question. Every once in a while you get someone who's like, ah, here's my rhetorical question. And you're like, ha ha. Yeah. You're funny or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. That is not what I mean. I mean, like something basic, like you go through the drive through at like fucking, I don't know, McDonald's and they go, do you want ketchup? And you're like, no. And then you get home and open your bag and there's fucking ketchup in it. Like it's not even that big of a <laughs> deal, but why did you even bother fucking asking me? <laughs> like it's, it's it's really not like in, in my head i know it's not a big deal because it's like whatever you just throw the fucking ketchup away but at the same time like you're wasting resources <laughs> your company's resources you're wasting time you took the effort to put the shit in there you asked me if i wanted it and i said no like <laughs> why did you even ask me if you weren't just like why didn't you listen to what i said you had one fucking job like i don't know <laughs> would you rather be asked if you want ketchup say no and have them include it or do you rather ask, be asked if you want ketchup, say yes, and have them not include it? I'd rather have something you need and not – I'd rather have something I don't need and you know, whatever. Or what's that? Uh, I'd rather have something and not need it than need it and not have it, obviously. But yeah. it's still annoying regardless. That's that's like the opposite is when you – like and this, but this is a peeve that makes sense, this one here. When you're like – you order like nuggets from somewhere and then give you your fucking sweet and sour or barbecue or whatever you have with them. That yeah. shit's annoying. But this is the opposite of that. And it's like, why did you yeah. give me extra sauce? Like, I know I have a friend who doesn't eat ranch with his tenders. And I'm like, oh, you're a freak. But he, he goes, <laughs> he, he goes, um, he's like, he, he'll get upset because they'll like give him the ranch. He's like, I don't need this. I'm like, give me your ranch. Get the fuck out of here. Like, but send it to the Cali boy. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the ketchup thing is one is just an example of that kind of thing. That's yeah. like, what? Oh, if it didn't matter, why does it? You know, yeah. 
People, Why did you waste your breath and my time? Yeah, exactly. Just like that that's just the, that's the best example it. I could think of now, but I'm sure there's other like instances if you think about that kind of scenario, you're like why did they ask me? I don't know. Fuck yeah. you. That's why. Like, that's how it'll fill. <laughs> yeah, they, they're they're following the pre-programmed skip, but or the pre-programmed script, but not uh, completing any of the actions required. It's a pro. It's like a robot that only has dialogue, but no uh, physical manifestation. It's like it can't, <laughs> cannot lift, catch up, put in by X. <laughs> like yeah why did you bother asking me like oh uh i'm gonna back up quick second uh because sure. I, I finally found it i couldn't remember the bastard's name because he's a really good artist empty e-m-p-t-y underscore i dot s empty i s uh that is the artwork uh that's the guy who does the artwork for the cthulhu cards that i want i've been waiting for another like print to go up but they're not uh <laughs> uh they're not up yet it's his IG handle, empty underscore I dot S. Anyway, back to Peeves. <laughs> no, I, I think that I think that pretty much sums it up. It's just like you know, it's like it's a superfluous thing that you've been like. It, it's torturous, right? It's just like you're you're being subjected to like the most thin cut of your time. It makes. It makes complete sense, but it is hilarious to, you know, it's like, it's only one second, you know, what you were you going to do with that? Nothing, but also fuck you. <laughs> uh, it's like, I, I play this, uh, this game. It's a, it's a crane MMO that has a lot of RNG based on it, like random number generator. So you go for something, it has an odds to fail and then whatever. Anyway, um, every once in a while, I'll hear someone in my group complain about something that they got by accident. Like they went for it because they wanted to fail to increase their chance of success on the next attempt, for example. Okay. And you'll hear someone complain like, oh, I was just trying to fail this thing and I accidentally got it. And I'm like, and you're complaining. <laughs> like you got something. Unless you completely yeah. fucked up, you got something. I'm like, oh, no, I tripped and landed on a pile of gold. Like that's the kind <laughs> of way I picture. Like why are you complaining about that? Just – Take your win and go. Charge it to the game if you lose. <laughs> All right. And with that, we're going to head to our second ad break. Because that's what you guys get. You win a second free ad. But don't go anywhere. Because when we get back, Michael is going to enter the lightning round. See y'all in a bit. Have you ever just looked at fried carbs in a blatant thought? I need to eat those, but it doesn't taste all that appetizing. Introducing Catsup. Catsup is a sugary and red syrupy paste that'll overshadow any unappreciated taste. Simply douse the unpreferred tasting object and ingest. Mmm. <sniffs> Thanks, Catsup. And we are back. Michael, are you ready to enter the... Oh, one second. Um, I just needed a drink of caffeine. Go ahead. He needs to get supercharged to enter the lightning round. All right. Put however much time it takes to bake this cookie on the clock. Michael, is there an all-powerful higher power? No. Shakira's voice in Danny DeVito's body or yes. Danny DeVito's voice in <laughs> Shakira's body? Shakira's uh, – Danny DeVito's voice in Shakira's body. <laughs> have you ever paid more for a meal than you made in a week no you're having the best day of your life what happens next another amazing thing or something terrible something terrible <laughs> are hot dogs sandwiches can be yes if you had the power to see the future but couldn't change it would you use it mm, no pineapple and pizza or fist fight fist fight Kill the spider or get an adult? Uh, uh, kill the spider. Is there a price for you to give up your passion forever? Um, yeah, um, yes, actually, yes. Kanye. Is that the question, Kanye? Yes. 
No. <laughs> Which do you max out first? Intelligence, charisma, or strength? Um, probably intelligence. Did you ever cheat on a test in school? Yes. Are we alone in the universe? No. Would you rather have your inner monologue sound like Gilbert Gottfried or Fran Drescher? <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> Are cheese it's addicting? Yes. Lions, tigers, or bears? Mm, bears. Make the food or do the dishes? Make the food. Is Marvel overrated? No. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? A uh, hundred duck-sized horses, for sure. Would 16-year-old you be proud of where you are today? Uh, yeah. yeah, actually. Do you create your own thoughts or just listen to them? Uh, create. If you have to only have one for the rest of your life, which would you choose, rice or pasta? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, pasta. Is the internet a net positive for mankind? Uh, yeah. Would you put your brain in a robot body if you could? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, because that needs more context. No. Would you rather have the power to shape shift, but only into a chair? Or super strength, but only when you're super tired. Strength. Could you eat 37 of your favorite food for $5,000 in a one hour time limit? Yeah. Congratulations. You've survived. Yeah. But before we move on to your prize, I, and likely many of the listeners at home, would like to know, what is your favorite food? Uh, well... That's why I was like, yeah, because my favorite food is spaghetti. So I'm like, is that individual noodles? Is that plates? I'm not sure how that works. That's why it's an interesting question for that. Uh, second is probably ice cream. It's like up there in that same little like whatever. But yeah, nebulous I don't know if that amount is you. X. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, uh, what's that thing? Mitch Hedberg's like, yeah, rice is good when you're hungry and want a million of something. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Fair play. Fair play. Like, there's a couple of those that are interesting. I was like, I feel like that needs no context. But, like, would you put your brain in a, a robot body? And I'm like, uh, well, yes is the, the quick answer I have. But I was like, does that mean right now? Because no, not right now. <laughs> like, if I'm going to die, yeah, let's preserve the brain in a robot body. That sounds awesome. But, like, right now, no. <laughs> it's like, would you write strength when you're always – like, I'm always tired, Captain. Like, <laughs> no, super tired. A super, like, go about – Sleep. tired yeah like the your superpower is gonna power you through whatever you need <laughs> that's kind of well, how it works right? no 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 it's going to you're going to be super strong you're not going to suddenly get more awake you're no just i know be, but like, like be able to jump over a building yeah just fucking that's all right if i'm fucking that tired i'm gonna jump the building hit the landing and then fall over and sleep <laughs> all right well either way you've discerned a You've discerned. All right. Discerned. You've deserved a hero's reward. Now, what lightning round question would you like to ask me and in turn be asked a future guests, hero? Hmm. Let's see. Um, all right. So if someone you cared about asked you, or uh, I'm sorry, if someone you cared about asked for your help in covering up a murder they had committed, would you help them? Yes. That's another one that's going to need more context for a lot of people. That's the one that's going to need to be more defined because it's like, there's a lot of people I care about that I wouldn't, but there's enough people that I care about enough that I would. So like that while there's only like probably 30% of the people that I would say I love and I like, you know, I have a strong connection with that I would do that for those 30, like if I'm going to answer that in the dark, I think those 30% of people are worth giving the 70% of people something that I don't think they deserve. Yeah. It's a tough one because like the, the, the short answer for me is no, but at the same time, like there's, there's context to it. Like if someone comes at me with like, Hey, this is what happened. They were doing this. And in self-defense, I did this. And I'm like, well, you don't even need to cover it up. You just need to call the cops and like it's yeah. self-defense. You didn't do anything wrong, but you're panicking. Right. Totally. Um, yeah. But then there's like, 
all right, well, you clearly killed them with malicious intent, but why? Yeah. Right? Why did you. you do that? Like, I feel like I need more more que- more answers and more – like, there's no way I'm doing it no questions asked. I need to know why this Totes. shit happened. Yeah. But there are scenarios I can picture where I'm like, oh, yeah, I- I've got your back. And there's scenarios where I'm like, no, what is wrong with you? You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, just call the cops. You did nothing wrong. Or, you know, yeah. they, 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 there's definitely more to it than that. But as a base answer, it'd be interesting to get people to be like, yeah, no, yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. We've come to the end of our time together. Is there anything you want to plug, recommend, places people can find you or your content? Um, uh, just I'm going to replug that artist because uh, they do some really good work besides cards, which is empty, E-M-P-T-Y underscore I dot S. Um, and the only one of my socials I'm going to plug is my, uh, my Instagram. It's a personal Instagram, so I just have basic stuff up there. Uh, or an older post, you can see some of my... Uh, some of my card collection, not all of it, but some of it. Um, but that's just third underscore cloud. And uh, yeah, th- those are the two I'm going to plug for now. Sweet. Well, thank you, Michael, for being my guest today. And uh, special thank thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And especially thank you, yes, you listening at home, or wherever you found time to appreciate this. Time is the most precious commodity we have, and I appreciate you spending yours with us. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, or just share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. Or if you already have and are out of episodes to listen to, don't worry. We put out a new podcast every Monday at midnight on SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify at Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast. And a very special thanks are due to our first Patreon patron, Sabella Yellow. And if you'd like to join said illustrious ranks and have your name read aloud, just head on over to patreon.com backslash backslash passionate people and preposterous peeves podcast and remember folks if all words are made up and you know what i mean why do you get angry when i say i hate your mother's cooking i hope she goes colorblind at a traffic stop <laughs>